All right, great. Thanks for the setup and the help. We appreciate that. Let me, uh, let me open us in a word of prayer, and then we'll get started. Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you for this conference. We, we know that there was tremendous labor and, and financial resources invested to make this possible. We thank you that, uh, that you allowed that to happen. Father, we understand the importance of your word, and we understand the life-saving nature of your gospel. Help us to be better ambassadors. Help us to take advantage of the doors of utterance that are before us. Help us to live our lives purposefully that we might be the ambassadors and might be the workmen you want us to be. It's in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. So thank you all for being here. I appreciate that. A couple of quick things just to, to cover and then we'll, we'll jump in. First thing I want to say, a big thank to, to, thanks to Richard who's been kind enough to give us the time to do this. Obviously didn't have to, so... I appreciate him doing that. Uh, the second thing I want to mention is that um, what you're going to see today are some ideas that have been largely developed by the saints in Chicago. And so Ben Wanda and Charlie and some other guys have, have pulled this together and really created a neat concept. So I'm just here. I've been blessed to be part of something they came up with. And so I don't want you to think that this is anything, you know, that, that we've come up with. It's just something we're passionate about and we want to share with you. And then the third thing I would just say is we're going to share with you some observations today. Not that we're experts or this is the only right way to do things because obviously that's not the case. But there's some things that I think we've all, all of us have learned in, in doing this that we thought might benefit you. And so that's, that's really what we're trying to do. Um, so here's what we're going to do. We have really sort of three sections as to what we're going to do this afternoon. The first is we're going to do some actual demos. And you can see the setup there. What you should picture in your mind's eye is this is at a county fair. And there's a booth there, so there's a little, you know, whether it's 10 by 10 or so booth, it could be indoors or outdoors, maybe a little tent. And you can see the table that's set up there. And what we're going to do is we're going to have two of the guys role play folks working the booth, how to deal with folks that come up. And then Charlie's going to come up, and he's going to come to the booth, and he's going to give you illustrations of how people sometimes react. So what we're going to do for the next, you know, however many minutes is we're just going to show you how some of those things normally play out. So Ben Wanda, Matt Hawley, Charlie McQuillan are going to give you a demonstration here. Gentlemen. Hey, sir, how you doing? You want to take a quick quiz? Oh, what a free prize. Exhibiting. Look at that. Whoa. What, yeah. do you got? what is this? Well, it's just a little quiz we do. We're, we're here at the booth at the fair set up, and we got a quick question here you answer. You get it right, light, it lights up. You get it wrong, it doesn't. And you get a free prize at the end. You know, I like, what, what is this here? Is, is this Alabama or Alabama? <coughs> roll, no, that's roll, roll Tide. Roll, roll Tide roll there, tide. yeah. Right. Yeah. No, that, that's Ohio State. Oh, check. Don't, don't come here. Stay over there and check. <laughs> yep. Well, red, so red for roll tide or for Christ's blood, either one. All right, well, praise the Lord. Amen. All right, so what do you got? So here? anyways, the question is, what do you have to do to get to heaven? So it's yes or no an questions, and you can answer, or yes or no on the, on the answer, and it's just about seven or eight questions here, okay? So the first one is, do you have to keep the Ten Commandments to get to heaven? How you doing with that? You ever keep the Ten Commandments? How's that going? How's that working out? <laughs> Not too good. <laughs> All right, so I got to Well, obviously, the answer is, well, let's try a yes. See. Whoa. So I think, it's I actually think, I no. Get, I didn't get zapped or anything. That's great. No zaps. <laughs> How about live a good life? I got to live a good life to get to heaven. Well, uh, what in the Sam Hill? Uh, yes. <laughs> oh, no. Give to the poor. I don't got any money to give to the poor, so. <laughs> I got that one right. <laughs> Pray daily, oh, you know. Talk to the Lord, that's good. Now I go to church regularly, I'm there too much. Be water <laughs> baptized, I, I'm not much of a swimmer. <laughs> Confess and turn away from your sins. My wife already knows my thoughts, so. <laughs> All right, praise God. Well, we got a mixed bag. You got some right, you got some wrong. So in, on this test, every single one of them is a no, 
Oh, Jabin is. And they're all a no because they all have all one thing in common, and that is you working to do something. Every one of these is you doing something to perform, to get eternal life, to go to heaven. What we're here trying to share with everyone is that the way you get to heaven is not by your works or your abilities or merit, but it's by what Christ did for you. So what you want to be doing is trusting and putting your faith in what Jesus did for you on the cross, where he died for your sins, he paid the price for you, and he rose from the dead to prove it. So you're saying, I don't have to live, I'm going to be Charlie now. <laughs> so I don't have to live a good life? Nope. Well, how, how, I, I thought God wants me to be good. I thought my good outweighs my bad, and, and he's going to judge me based on, on my, my ability to, to make him happy with me. That's a lot of times what religion will tell you or man will tell you, but what God's word says, which is the authority that we are all subject to, God's word says today for us that it's by faith alone. So you're telling me all I need to do is just believe. And what am I believing? You're, you're I believing trust? and you're trusting in that what Christ did was enough for you. So when he died on the cross, he paid for your sins and my sins. Wow. Ephesians 2 says that all, or Ephesians 2 says you're saved by grace through faith and that not of yourselves, it's a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. I can see that. It's easy as that. And then you get a prize. Well, praise the Lord, but we don't want Ohio. We want. <laughs> <laughs> we'll take green. So go get, your, go get your wife, and she can do the quiz now, too. Hey, babe, come on, check. <laughs> check come on, babe. So who's, what, who's next? I am. Matt's going to do okay. this now. <clears throat> so we, gotta, we, gotta, we need two Ohio guys here, obviously. Yeah. We need two Ohio guys. So this, the second one we're going to do is a lot of times when you're at the fair and people are coming up, because you've got the colorful tracks and the colorful bracelets, the kids come running up, and they want to play with what's going on. So usually I take it a little bit different direction with the kids, and when they're coming up and playing with the board, I try and distract them and move them to something else to share the gospel with them. And a tool that we've been using is a tool, it's just a track called a gospel flip out, which is basically a, um, it's a wordless book. So you're, you're going to end up going through the wordless book with the kids. So Charlie's going to play one of the kids, and we'll just kind of run through it. But the, the beautiful thing about dealing with kids at the fair is generally their parents are forcing them to listen as well. And their parents are listening. And kids rarely come up alone. There's usually three or four, and parents are there listening as well, so they're going to get a clear presentation of the gospel as well. Is this where I'll get ice cream? I need some ice cream for my tummy. Where, I don't know why you're laughing. I'm hungry. It's no. hot out in this festival. I'll tell you. It's... <laughs> so the first thing I usually do is ask the parents' permission. <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> is it all right if I share a Bible story with the kids? What? Sherry, Sherry, Sherry. Sherry. I, I guess. I got CrossFit. Right. I'm, 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 I'm <laughs> it's, I'm so, telling you, it's hot out here. So what's your name? Uh, Ed. Okay. I'm, in, I'm, Ed. In, I'm in the Bible, you know. Special. Well, okay. right. <laughs> so, let me ask you a question. Do you know what sin is? No. I don't, well, I don't know. The, the, I, I'm not sure. Well, the Bible tells us about sin. And the Bible tells us that sin is something that everybody has. You've got it. I've got it. David's got it. Everybody here in this room has sin. And sin, the Bible tells us in Romans chapter 3, verse 23. At this point, I usually show them the verse. It tells us that every one of us has done it. And what sin is, is it's anything that we do, say, think, or even don't do that God wants us to do. You ever disobey your parents? I love my mom. She, she, yeah, well, yeah, I did. I've yeah, done it yeah. a couple times. Yeah, you, ever, yeah. You, ever, you ever lied? Uh, yeah, okay. I'd be more. <laughs> you know, ice cream was this big. It's really yeah. you know. <laughs> well. The, Bi the the Bible tells us that that every one of us has done that, and that lying that's a perfect example for, uh, of sin. And and the problem with sin is this: is God loves us. And did you know God loves you? Yeah, he would love me. Yeah. yeah. Well, the, 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 the Bible tells us that God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners. So Christ died on the cross for your and I sin. You see, the problem with our sin is it keeps us from God. So God loves us, and he wants us to spend eternity with him. But the problem is, is we have this problem called sin that keeps us 
from spending eternity with him. The Bible tells us in Romans chapter 6, verse 23, that the wages of sin is death. And that's not just death like car accidents or heart attacks or things like that, but the Bible tells us about a thing called the second death. At this point, I'd take them to Revelation. Tell me a little bit about that. I don't, I don't like the second death. That's why I do CrossFit. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> I, I lied about my reps, but that's a different thing. So. Well, nobody likes the second death when you read about it, honestly. And God didn't want us, God does not want us to experience that. He wants us to spend eternity with us with him in heaven. So the Bible tells us that he sent his son, Jesus Christ, God in the flesh, to take our punishment. You ever get in trouble at home? All, all the time. Do you yeah, have to go I to do. time out? Yeah, no, well, I do. Jesus Christ took that punishment of our death on himself when men nailed him to the cross and they killed him and he died. And he didn't stay there. He rose again the third day. And the Bible tells us that God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And the Bible tells us that he took our place. And the wonderful thing about him taking our place is that sin that we have when he died on the cross, when we decide that we trust him, this is a bracelet I'm going to give you at the end. But it's just like one of those that like your heart is good for your heart. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good. Can I take it? But if we, <laughs> if we pretend if we pretend that this is our sin, what happens is when we trust Christ, when we believe that He paid the price for our sin and that. He took care of everything that needed to be done for us to get to heaven. When we trust that God takes our sin and he, it's, it's there on Christ, he took the punishment. And then God takes Christ's righteousness and he puts it on us. And what that means is that we can then spend eternity with God in heaven because our sins are forgiven. And the wonderful thing about this, this isn't something you can buy, it's just a simple gift that if you just simply trust, you can have it. So at this point. I, I like that, that's, that's <laughs> good. If you come to Dispensational Bible Church, and, and, and we'll te we teach that there. Okay, so, and, and we got ice cream, you don't have any ice cream at all? Yeah, it's not good. But at this point, you'd give them a track to take home, hand it out to their, their, their uh, parents, and let them know that, uh, let them know where the church is and things like that if, if, if they, they want to. And, and you, you give them a prize at the end, so that way they've got something to take home. The prize usually has <clears throat> just a simple statement on it, Christ died for our sins, was buried and rose again. And you can either put your church website or something on the inside or the key to truth that uh, Ben's put up. And the stuff flies off the table. And, and I'll just say, too, when, when you do this, and, and kids do come, kids are, especially junior high age, they're, they're, really, um, they're really fun to talk to. When they come, and even younger, mom and dad will be standing behind them. Now, they might have a clear testimony, and so they expect their kids to just know. And what they find out is maybe they don't really have the, the clarity issues um, really understood about the gospel. So what, what happens a lot of times is, you go through the information, and then mom or dad or whoever's there, they, they realize they're, they're alerted to the fact that preaching the gospel clearly is, isn't something that's all that common. And so they, you know, so we have some really interesting results. Uh, every year, every time we do this, um, that is a big, a big thing. So it, it does have an impact on, on the parents in relationship to the kids and, and other kids with them. So, if you do this, keep that in mind that you're, you're not just talking to one person, you're getting a bunch, and there's multiple things that you are dealing with when, when someone comes to the board. Just alerting you know, mom and dad to the clarity of the gospel is well, a big deal. You'll hear a lot of parents say, ah, you know the answer to this, yeah. and the kid doesn't. <laughs> and uh, it kind of is a, an indictment <laughs> that they need to be a more, little more clear. And then also real quick, this is basically the same design as this, except it's just in a smaller form. So yesterday what we did, and we did this last year too, and we talked about it. We took the teens out last year, and they used this, and we walked around St. Charles yesterday. So we had three groups of teens and fours, um, and they, they went out with this board and some bracelets and you know some of this free stuff, and they did it for about two hours, and each group probably talked to the, you know, 20, 30 people in just a couple hours. And it's the same idea where they were able to go through the questions, talk to them, and 
you know, there was times where they would sit there and they would talk to a couple or a family for sometimes 10, 20 minutes. Um, so it's so much more effective than, it, than just the track that you hand out that half the time ends up on the floor in the garbage can a block down the street. And uh, so it's, it's a great opportunity for you to do with your family as well. Um, and then this obviously is a much more flexible thing because you can go out on a Sunday. You know, you can go door to door or you could go out on a Sunday to the park and hand out some tracks that way too. If you don't want to set up a whole booth and go to a fair and set, you know, go through all the requirements that's required there. So there are, these are some of the options we've used. Also, we have an iPad app. Brother Bruce, is it, is it Rouser? 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 Rouser. Rouser. Brother Bruce Rouser in Florida, Dez's Church. Um, he creates apps. So last year, he created an app that functions with the iPad, and it's free. So if you're interested in that, let me know. I can give you that information. And he, that one is even more interactive than these. It's, you know, when you hit yes, if you get it right, it pops up. You know, you got it right. If you got it no, a screen pops up and tells you no, it, why, and gives you a verse reference. And the same idea where it has a lot of uh, interactive type stuff. So if, if you want to go that digital with it and, and carry around an iPad, that's also an option as well. So this is, these are all tools we found effective uh, that we've used and some of the other brothers here now in Ohio have been using. So it's just we want to get these tools out to you. You guys tweak them. You use them the way you see fit. But the idea is giving you every opportunity to make it easier for you so you don't have to do all the legwork to figure some of this stuff out initially. So, mm -hmm. Yeah? Let's give the guys a hand for us. Uh... <laughs> that, that was an awesome demonstration. And uh, Charlie's going to be a Hollywood actor. <laughs> um, so that, that was tremendous. I want to now just give you a couple things. I really love this ministry, and I've been sort of thinking about it scripturally as to, to, you know, does this make sense, does it not? And I want to share some things with you. So if you would get Acts 13. So what, what I'm going to share with you here, these are some observations I have. If you think they're wrong, then don't hold them against Ben or Charlie or, or Matt. Um, but these are some things that I, I think are, are true. I think the following is a fair description of what Paul did. Although Paul preached in many different environments and circumstances, I would argue he did the following. He focused his ministry on one, the right places, and two, the right people. And I'm not going to go real long here, but I just want to share some thoughts with you. And what I mean by the right places is this. He went to synagogues or other places where it was appropriate to speak on spiritual matters. I'm not saying that's all he did, but I'm saying that's what he focused on. The second thing he did is he focused on the right people, in other words, people who had expressed interest. So look with me at Acts 13, if you would. Acts chapter 13. Acts chapter 13, verse 15. So start in verse 14, but when they departed from Perga, they came to Antioch in Pisidia and went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and sat down. Verse 15, and after the reading of the law and the prophets, the rulers of the synagogue sent unto them, saying, Ye men and brethren, if ye have any word of exhortation for the people, say on. And one of the things that apparently happened in the synagogue is there was an opportunity for folks to share things. So when they go into the synagogue, they're going into a place where it is appropriate and, and proper for them to do that. I don't know if you've ever seen a city council meeting on TV. Have you ever bothered to watch one of those? Um, what happens, the way a city council meeting works, anyone can sign up for five minutes and talk about anything, right? And, and people just do that. Well, the synagogue was similar in the sense that if anyone had a word of exhortation, they had an opportunity to stand up and say it. And that's, that's part of what Paul did. Look at Acts 18. Acts chapter 18, verse 19. Acts 18, 19, and he came to Ephesus and left them there, but he himself entered into the synagogue, and then notice, and reasoned with the Jews. There was an opportunity there for him to have a substantive discussion. Look at Acts 19, verse 8. And he went into the synagogue and spake boldly for the space of three months. There was obviously an opportunity for him to speak there. 
disputing and persuading the things concerning the kingdom of God. So there's an open door there. He takes it. He has the opportunity to per persuade folks. But in verse 9, notice what happens. But when diverse were hardened, so he's spoken to the group as a large. There are folks that reject it. So notice what he does. But when diverse were hardened and believed not, but spake evil of that way before the multitude, he departed from them and separated the disciples, disputing daily in the school of one Tyrannus. So when that door closed, in other words, when it became apparent that that was not going to be fruitful, what he did is he, he shifted his location. Notice he did the same thing, it seems, with Gentiles. Look at Acts 16. Acts chapter 16. The, the, the reason I tell you all this, and, and I, I don't know about your background, I, I sort of was sort of trained with the understanding that the more aggressive you were and the harder and the more opposition you encountered, the tougher you were and the more zealous you were. And I'm not certain that I wasn't just beating my head against walls that didn't need to be beaten against. Um, look with me at Acts 16, verse 13. And on the Sabbath, we went out of the city by a riverside. And then what does it say? Where prayer was wont to be made. In other words, what Paul did is he went to a place where they expecting there in that location for spiritual conversations to occur. And the answer is yes. It's a place where people went to pray. Look with me at Acts. Uh, we looked at, at Acts 19 with the school of one Tyrannus. When Paul leaves the synagogue, he goes in Tyrannus' school, an academic institution where people are expecting to have dialogues of that nature. Now notice, go, go with me to Acts 19 verse 9. And I want, this time I want to read verse 10 along with it. Acts 19 verse 9, but when divers were hardened and believed not, but spake evil of that way before the multitude, he departed from them, so he leaves. He separ and separated the disciples, disputing daily in the school of one Tyrannus. So he goes into Tyrannus' school. Now, one of the objections you're going to get is this. Well, if that's what you do, if you go to the, this specifically selected audience, there's going to be a whole bunch of people you won't reach. Read verse 10. And this continued by the space of two years. Where is he for two years? He's in the school of one Tyrannus. What happens? So that all they which dwelt in Asia heard the word of the Lord Jesus, both Jews and Greeks. Here's what happens. So, so the folks in Chicago are blessed. The folks in Columbus are blessed. The folks in Cincinnati are blessed. If you reach your city, if you reach the folks there, there's enough people that travel there from surrounding suburbs and other locations that by reaching the folks there, you reach other folks. And what apparently happened there, Paul separates himself, goes into the school of one Tyrannus, stays there for a couple years, and what happens? According to that verse, he reaches Asia. I mean, that's what the verse says, isn't it? So I thought that, that might be an encouragement to you. Look at Acts 13. Let's talk about the right people. So the first thing is Paul went to the right places. The second thing, he went to the right people. Acts 13, verse 42. And when the Jews were gone out of the synagogue, the Gentiles besought that these words might be preached to them the next Sabbath day. What's happening? There are people saying, come teach us, right? We want to hear this. Look with me at Acts 28. Acts chapter 28. Acts chapter 28, notice verse 17. Acts 20, 17. And it came to pass, this is when Paul's in Rome, that after three days Paul called the chief of the Jews together. And when they were come together, he said unto them, Men and brethren, though I have committed nothing against the people or customs of our fathers, yet was I delivered prisoner from Jerusalem into the hands of the Romans. So what he does here in, in, when he arrives in Rome, he calls together the chief of the Jews. So he summons all of them and he presents that information to them which is what he understands he should do. But then notice verses 22 and 23. But we desire to hear of thee what thou thinkest, for as concerning this sect, for we know that everywhere it is spoken against. And when they had pointed him a day, there came many to him in his lodging, to whom he expounded and testified the kingdom of God, persuading them concerning Jesus, both out of the law of Moses 
and out of the prophets from morning till evening. So what Paul seems to do in Acts 28, he starts with a broad appeal to a larger group, and then he's able to identify some folks that have greater interest, and he focuses his time on them. So you can, th this is my observation, th these are, you know, my thoughts, and Ben, Charlie, Matt may have other ones, or you may disagree with them, and that's just fine, I'm just giving you my thoughts. I've done things in the past where, uh, like for example, I've done ministries where we go door to door, and what will happen is you'll get one guy that wants to talk to you, and his purpose of talking to you is he wants to argue with you for an hour. I don't know if you've ever encountered that, I've encountered that. And so you get through the whole evening and you realize, I spent my entire evening talking to a guy that had decided before I showed up at his door he didn't agree with me, and he wasn't going to agree with me, and I, I spent the time there, and it was okay because I was trying to teach the gospel, but what I was doing is I was spending time with someone that had already decided not to be there. What we didn't illustrate in, in those demonstrations, but is another thing that happens, is the most common reaction, or one of the common, is people walk by the booth because you're in, you know, you're in a row, and a lot of them just walk right on, right? And you know what that is? That's a win, because here's what happened. Were they confronted with the fact that they had an opportunity to hear the gospel? Yes, they were, right? And they made a decision and said, I'm not going to do it. But did you fulfill your responsibility? Yes, you did. And so one of the things, I'll, I'll give you an example. When, when um, I heard from some of the brethren about this ministry and they, they extended the offer to us to, to do something like it, and, and, and Ben was kind enough to have some of the boards made that we could use. We were trying to figure out what to do. And so we ended up doing a, a, a week-long event at a county fair near us where the, the total attendance uh, as of two years ago was 236,000. And so there's a couple different buildings, but long tail short, I can't say that every one of the people there went through the building, but more, more than more of them that did than didn't, right? When you go to the fair, you walk around, you see everything. So by my, my guess is that what happened is there's over 100,000 people that walked by. Not all of them stopped. I, I'm not saying they did. But did, were, all of them can, were all of them presented with the opportunity? Yes, they were. And you know what happened? The folks that stopped were the people that self-selected to have a conversation. So I don't know about you. My experience in the past has been this. The way I was taught to do evangelism was what you go and do is you find people and you interrupt what they're doing and you force them to have a conversation with you in the moment. I don't know if you, maybe I was taught differently, but that's what I was taught to do. Well, if you think about that, is that a recipe for success? It's not, right? And so Matt used the example yesterday. He's perfectly right. Do door to door on Sunday afternoon, and the immediate reaction everyone has is, you know football's on TV, what are you doing? <laughs> right? Why are you wasting my time? Don't you know any better? Now, of course, we think about it from the standpoint of, look, it's more important for you to have eternal life than to watch this game, but that's not the way people think about it. And I can tell you what happens to me, honestly, is different people will come and knock on our door. Jehovah's Witnesses or otherwise, and I normally don't get the door. And, and the reason why, and I'll just confess this to you, is they're all, they, they never have an appointment. They're always knocking at a point in time when I'm doing something else. And so the thought in my mind becomes, do I want to stop what I'm doing and spend time in this or not? And this is from someone that cares about the gospel. So my point is what happens is some of the, some of the basic evangelistic techniques we've been taught are not really calculated to be successful because they're, they're, they're going to people at, at, at a moment in time where they're not in the frame of mind to receive what you're doing. What's so wonderful about the fair is people are there, they have free time, right? They're walking by the booth and if they stop, it's because they've chosen to stop. What I found to be the case, and, and you guys can all chime in if you disagree, there were next to no negative conversations. There was almost no one that argued with us because what happened is people chose to, to be there. Now, what, what that, you know, 
there's a tremendous benefit in that, and here's why that was sort of relevant to us. When we were thinking about doing this, and I'd encourage anyone that, that's thinking about doing this in your church to, to, to consider doing it, I had to figure out a way, because I was not going to be able to be there the whole week. I wasn't going to be able to be there. What I normally, my preference would have been, here's what I'll do. I'll be there the whole week, and we'll just have different folks from the assembly sit there and watch me, and, you know, they'll learn it, right? Because I can be there the whole time. Well, we, when we signed up for this, it, it, was, a, it was actually an eight-day event, I believe, and I couldn't be there the whole time. So one of the things we were confronted with then is how do you train people to do this? And the first question that goes through people's mind is, you know this, well, they're going to ask me a question I don't know, right? Isn't that what we all think? I mean, you think that, I think that. And so I started creating this handout I was going to give everyone of all the, you know, here's, if you get this objection, here's what you do. And I created a two-page thing of that. And then I was training people in the assembly, and they said, well, wait a minute, what if they ask this? I'm like, okay, I'll add that to the list. And, you, and what happens? Well, the list becomes endless, right? Because there's always a question people can ask that, that you don't know the answer to. Now, you guys disagree with me if this is wrong. When we did it, the only real objection that we got, I would say 97% of the objections, was works. Would you... Would you Agree with that? No one asks you about Mephibosheth. No, you know, they just don't. What happens is if you present the gospel, the only real objection they have is it can't be that easy. What about water baptism? What about works? And in fact, the way the questions that you, that you saw how those were designed, all those questions were designed for people to latch on and say, I need to do this. The light doesn't light up, and it segues perfectly into the conversation about it's grace, not works. Now, my point in telling you that is this. I think sometimes we build up in our minds greater objections than people really have. You follow me? We can worry about they're going to say this, they're going to say that, they're going to ask something I don't know. The bottom line for most folks, and I can't tell you that there won't be some unusual person that wants to argue, but for most folks, the issue is they think they have to do something. So what happens is if you've taught your people the gospel, salvation is by grace through faith, not of works, they're going to be able to deal with it because it's always the same objection. Do you guys, I mean, I think that's, that was our experience. So let me give you a couple more thoughts, and then um, I'm happy. We'll, we'll, we'll all take questions if you have them, or some of you may have comments about your experiences you want to share. Um, the thing that I would say about this is that... Um, and this is a worldly analogy, but, but what all marketers want to do is they want people to self-select, right? In other words, they want the people that are interested in their product, that's who they want to spend their time with. And the beauty of this is that's essentially what happens. The people that stop and talk are the ones that you want to spend your time with. I've spent hours and hours dealing with people that just wanted to argue with me. Well, that, that happens a lot less uh, in this environment. Uh, the next thing I would say is that uh, what we found is that it was actually a very pleasant experience. There was very little hostility. Now, that's not a guarantee. There could be others. I had, I had one gentleman that we had sort of a, a, a negative reaction, and I ended up getting lunch with him later, and we had a good conversation. But he was a guy that basically thought that works were relevant to salvation. And it was sort of embarrassing because what does happen a little bit is, so there's right and wrong answers. So sometimes what happens is the person is sitting there and they're getting them wrong. Their wife's looking over their shoulder. And, and so sometimes, you know, there'd be a little bit of unease. But honestly, there was nothing that was really, really that bad. And I, I'll tell you this. This is sort of sad, but this is the reality. It, w if you work the booth for four or five hours, I'll just... I hope I'm wrong on this. You'll present the gospel more times than you will in the next six months. I, I mean, I, I, I sort of believe that's true. Um, just the reality of it. So it's, it's one of those things where after we did it for our assembly, we've been struggling to find any other environment that is 
as favorable as this because it was just so positive and our folks are chomping at the bit to do it again because they, they had the opportunity to talk to more people about the gospel than they do on a normal day because it just, the opportunities just don't present themselves. Matt, uh, Matt really helped me out a lot because he showed you, you know, the, those gospel buttons and those things are incredible because they sort of have the appearance of a magic trick, right? And they fold out and they create a story and, and now what you have is this visual and, and by the way, the other thing that is that's so interesting about it is you, you do always talk to more than one child at once. And what happens is there may be one person that takes the quiz, but it quickly becomes an audience and there's other folks that are hearing it, right? So you get essentially the whole group there with. The, the guy next to us trying to sell sighting or whatever it was, he knew the gospel at the end of the week so well. It was just <laughs> amazing, right? <laughs> I mean, he, I'm like, you want, you want to take a turn? You can do this. But, um, and then you'll have a little bit, you'll have the Jehovah's Witnesses will send over their children to spy on what you're doing. And that's fun too, because what is that, you know, you have an opportunity there to tell them the truth, right? So the, it's, my, my point is what happens is we, we started out and we were going to try to count the number of times we presented the gospel and we just quit doing it because you'd have this single presentation where six people heard it, right? And it just, it was just tremendous. Um, the other thing I would say, I give, I give Ben and Charlie a lot of credit for this, the thing that's very nice about this format is it's non-threatening, right? So it's a quiz, you get a free prize, it's very low-key. Uh, the other thing I'll tell you, so the wristbands are, are, are one of the items of choice. Um, I, I like them personally for a couple reasons. One, they are completely inexpensive. I mean, they're probably like 10 cents a piece. They're next to nothing. The way that, that we've imprinted ours, um, and you can do it different ways, but ours is Christ died for our sins, was buried, and rose again. And so what happens, here's basically what happens. You can get ones that have different colors. You can also get ones that are glow-in-the-dark. So what happens is the little kids come up. You give them a glow-in-the-dark wristband. Perfect, right? Why would you ever take that off? You can wear it at night, and it glows in the dark. And now what you have is for 10 cents, you've given someone something that is a perpetual reminder of the gospel. So it's, it's I don't know, it was, it was so exciting. And then you would, as, then they're just, by the way, when you hand it to them, they immediately put it on. So they're going to walk around the fair with it. So it, it's one of those things for basically no investment. You're giving people something that will stick with them for at least some period of time and remind them of the gospel. Uh, let's see. So the, the glow in the dark wristbands were, were positive, and uh, the the booth was um, incredibly efficient in terms of the number of time, number of opportunities to present the gospel. So it was something where uh, I didn't know going into it that it would be as positive as it was, but for our for our saints, it was something where universally every single one, every single person that did it said, I'm really glad I did it, and I want to do it again. And so I would just commend that to you as something that uh, our folks enjoyed. It's not the only way to present the gospel. There's lots of other tactics and lots of techniques. But this one is one that we found a lot of value in. So those are, that's what I wanted to say. So what we're going to do now is um, we have plenty of time. But some of you may have comments. Or, and uh, Bill, I think you've been done some of this. And if you have comments, we'd be happy to hear those. And if you have questions for... For Charlie or Matt or Ben or me or, or anything like that, we'd be happy to take them. So I'll just, yeah, please. I have a question. I'm sure it's maybe still a little unstructured. Sure. Um, I have very autistic children, so I have uh, some people coming to my home that help me, and God gave me the opportunity to one of the people who is there and he just right, right for it. He was really honoring me. So he's been doing that with me this whole time. And just this couple weeks ago, he went to a fair, and he came back from the fair, and he said, do you see? I had a, I was went through and bought a booth, and I had one on the shoulder, and it actually was functioning, and it was similar, very similar. Really? And he said, I had been to Paul, and you never know how to answer these. And I got them almost all right. <laughs> and um, But they were very similar. They were like, you know, do you have to wear it? You know, like, you know, these kinds of things. Question about is um, I know I've spiritually had 
and I'm thinking about the journey of being a mother. Like, is there any place for that? I don't. I know you don't want to confuse them because salvation is separate mm -hmm. from how we are set up, or it doesn't even apply to the same issue that the Lord has talked about. So, and I'm interested in how you guys would answer this as well. What I, what I would say to that would be. I often, in presenting the gospel, will touch briefly on 1 Corinthians 3 and the judgment seat for the following reason. I think when you tell someone the difference between salvation and rewards, it clarifies for them it does matter how you live. In other words, if you present the gospel and you say, you're, you're saved by grace through faith and your works are completely irrelevant for your salvation, it's 100% true. But people have this nagging question, so, so wait a minute then, if I believe what you're saying, then I can live like an idiot and there's no consequence. Well, I didn't say that. There is a consequence at the judgment seat of Christ. So sometimes when I present the gospel, to the extent I perceive there to be an issue, I will tell the person, here's what happens. What you then do with the rest of your life determines your reward. It doesn't determine your salvation, but let's get clear, your salvation has nothing to do with work. So I find it to be something that sometimes is, is clarifying and helpful, but gents, yeah? I think it's, when you get that question, I tell my folks to pat themselves on the back because they presented the gospel well, because if you, look at, if you look at the layout of Romans and you see justification, one of the next things you run into is Romans chapter 6, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? So, God knew that that's the first question that man asks when he understands the gospel. That's why it's there in Romans chapter 6. So I usually take them there to Romans chapter 6 and just answer it with the scripture. Yes, ma'am. What do you do with a person who wants to argue with you for an hour? What, what I, I have an answer, but one of you guys, what would you say? Yeah, it, it, I've, the, the, all that advice is good advice. I never found them to like really continue on after you sort of shoo them. Yeah. Leon. Yeah, Brother Dave. Uh, number one, uh, I, I'll try to speak loud enough for everybody to hear me. Uh, I think that apparatus there is just nice. Whoever came up with that came up with an excellent way to uh, evangelize. I had a twofold question there. Number one, where? Church. 
Number two, how often do you do this? Is it once a week, like on Sundays, or is it every day? Or is it how? Well, the, we try to, you have a booth, so you usually have a 10 by 10 or 12 by 12 booth. So is it like at a fair? Or at a fair, fair. Yeah. at an event. So you're talking about a large crowd. So, I mean, right. if this church is in a city and you want to set up on the side of the street, you could do it. But the idea is you're getting high traffic. So if you've got a corner spot, the, in, in Walworth, they have a corner booth. So they get traffic coming this way and they get traffic coming this way. So they'll set up tab the tables on both sides. And you just bring them in as, as you can. If you see it back it up, we'll have five, six, seven people. You know, I had 12 teams all at once do one booth, one, one question board all at once. Um, so you just, as far as traffic goes, that's a good problem. The more crowds you have, the bigger it gets because yeah. once they see a crowd and a bunch of tiny stuff, <laughs> yeah, because the crowd is good, you want a little bit of a crowd. Well, well, just kind of fun. The other question is, do you do a set meeting every day or once a week? We started with one fair. One fair. And then it is difficult to find certain events. We've tried multiple oh, other types of uh, Fourth of July festivals. Uh, people do sets and days for their town or the city or the county. Some are some will not allow it. We've done them for the Lions Club. We've done the county fair. Uh, we've done the flea market. That answers my question. Events like that. Sure. Go ahead. Can they send you some kind of an iPad or something? Yeah, I can leave that information up to you if you want. And so we're doing this, except it has three different. So I have, I forgot to name check. These say, both these boards say, what do I have to do to get to heaven? So when David taught at 11, he said there were two issues people coming to be saved and then the knowledge of the truth. So what we also have is another board that our goal is that's to bring them to the knowledge of the truth. So if somebody gets saved, they're positive to the truth, and they look like they're ready for that next step and we want to give them something more, then we would give them that. So the app has three different surveys on there. So based on where that person is, we can make the call about you know which survey we want to give. Start with the first one. Go ahead, Russ. So one of the things we do um, is I create, we have a one-page handout that has all the questions, the right answer, and then the verses. So what we typically do is they leave with their bracelet. You hand them that, so hopefully later on they read it and it cements it in their mind. Yeah, you give them a question. Yes, that's, that's right, sir. Go right ahead. Yeah. The, the, the thing that I found is we use we use day tracks, the mid axe tracks, which are very bright. The bracelets are very bright, and so kids come running up to see that stuff right away. And then the other thing is is you'll find with the teens they're very pliable, and you can call them out. Hey, I don't think you can do this. Yeah. And they come flying out. The other question I had was. Because if, if the kids are there with other groups of kids, 
They go grab their friends and bring them to yeah. Rome. And on don't have to recite this, this, this is in the place. I've had the same kid bring back five to seven of his friends yeah. over and over and over again. Yeah. It's, 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 they round them up for you halfway through the day. You don't have to do it. It's, it's <laughs> what you would call stupid and immature. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you just set it up and it happens. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, Ted. Amen. Charles, did you have some? Get more. Ricky? Good. Yeah, Matt. One, one other thing. We, well, we had a guy in our church who took the board and he ended up making, they had an LED. And uh, we added buzzers to it for a false answer. So the whole day buzzers are going off. So there's also, <laughs> there's also an audio that, you know, people are two booths down and they keep hearing, ah, ah, And they're like, what's going on? So they come over so that it's not just visual. Yes, Rodney. So, do how many people end up 
in your church as a result of all this? I mean, is the goal to try to get people to come to, uh, come to church and learn the word, or is it just to share the gospel and never see them again? I mean, so, do you actually get people yeah, in the church? I think or? initially the thought was more, I know my thought was, we're going to share the gospel with 400 people, and the folks <coughs> that have dug in on me now start coming to church. The numbers have not been good for that. Uh, part of that is, I think some of the ways we've been wanting to do it in the future could maybe make that better, but I don't know, for the first year I thought more, this is getting people saved primarily. Yeah. Uh, now, yeah. Charlie, you've got two families coming to you mostly now, right? Yeah, well, we, as we started doing this stuff, Ray kind of started experimenting with, with this in the inner city uh, Wisconsin, and there was a local church, and uh, I, I want to say something to that. When, when you do the big county church, you're getting people from all over. Mm -hmm. So, so it's kind of hard to, you know, even the Wallace County Church is kind of south of Wisconsin, and uh, we have people from everywhere. I mean, you know, hardly anyone is from Lake Geneva, you know, City, that kind of, you know, here's the people, so it's kind of everywhere. Uh, when you have the locals, you know, that's, they're smaller, uh, they're a little less active, but people are there, and so they're, they're kind of a community thing. And so we had people respond and, and come. Uh, we actually have a, a couple of, uh, one family and another family that's been coming, and they're, you know, the one guy's really learning a lot, and that's kind of his home church now, you know, and, but that was from the local church. So I, I would encourage, you know, sometimes you think you, you get a bigger bigger uh, number with the county church. It's much harder to, to see them come in your door. Um, and there are some things that we're kind of brainstorming on how to encourage that. Uh, but that's, that's a lot harder. It's such a quick sort of type of thing. One other idea, and this does help when you have a county church, and, and we want to try this this year, is that if you have a conference or something that's local at your church, or just like a weekend type of thing, one of the ideas we have is we have everything planned out, mapped out, and we have postcards and a box. And on the, on the one side, they can fill out these geographical things we're doing now. And I, some of those kind of geek out on those, but we have them brochure on the back of that. And all, all it is, is we're not going to post them and, and invite them around, but you just mail that back to them, and it's a reminder of that conference. So if people are, you know, you're going to have to kind of figure who who the demographic's going to be and, and cater that, you know, you could have a, a weekend where you're teaching things like the gospel, right division, the Bible issue, things of that sort. But what happens is they say, yeah, I'm interested, but then they have nothing that reminds them. And then three days later, a week later, they're back to life. They're not thinking about, you know, going to the, to the church and, and learning some more. They kind of get busy with life. So if we were thinking if there was a way we can remind them and, uh, and the experience that they have with the booth, you know, uh, that's something that they can come back to. So that's, that's one of the things we're going to do this year. Um, but the goal is to get people. You don't want to just see people get saved and then they're out in the, you know, there's no, there's no way to keep contact with them. Because then you're kind of, they're susceptible to the, the spiritual attacks that are out there and that are going to be after them. So uh, it's, it, that there, some creativity needs to be, be on that end for sure. It would seem to me that you know, having been in sales all my life, and you do a presentation, ultimately, you want to close the sale, yeah. right? I mean, because if you just talk to them and nothing happens, and it would seem to me that you, you're doing a great presentation, the gospel is being presented, that if you could look at someone and say, you know, this person seems serious, and somehow really introduce them to the importance of belonging to a local assembly, bringing their family to learn the Bible, and somehow bringing some strong encouragement. Because that's ultimately, getting them saved is great, but then letting them out there. That's dangerous. That's yeah. not right either. Right. So, you know, you want to try, I think you want to try to refine a close. Yeah. And just, I'm, I'm not talking about strangholding them and saying, you know, you're going to be. But I'm talking about encouragement to somebody who seems interested mm -hmm. and engage in a conversation. Have you ever belonged in a church? Where did you go? And try to, you know, I, I'm not just thinking. That, that seems to me you want to go there, too. That's That's been the challenge. Yeah. yeah that that's something we've been trying to work on over the like year, yeah. too. Something about that. Yeah. That, that is easier to do in a local mm -hmm. fair situation. We yeah. have 
yes. what's called the Constitution Festival. It's a, it's a local town thing. How people come in, they have a Christian <coughs> concert at the end, so you have a lot of people <coughs> from out of town. But if, you ha if you're in a local venue, that gives you a chance. And, and you want to, my you. goal is to put a piece of literature in their hand, too, so they remember where they had this conversation and who they talked to. You know, this is our ministry type of thing. We'll have three types of literature. We'll have, um, we'll have Tom Bruchet's book on the Dictionary Gospel. We'll have the big picture by John Verstegen. I forget what the other one is, we, but there was a third one, too. And the idea was if we did see someone writing like you're talking about, it really shows that interest and is ready for that next step, that next level, we'll, we'll invest that extra five, ten dollars Here's a book. This is the next step for you. And I'll open it up and I'll write my name and my number in yeah. right there in the first page. Right. You call me. So yeah. Yeah. that is another way that we try to reach out. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Um, I just wanted to share something that I've been kind of working on um, is using social media. And I started just a local Bible study. And my expectation was that I was going to get more people like myself who wanted to study the Bible. But I've actually gotten a lot of contact from people who either they don't really know the gospel. They just know that they're missing something and they need something. And they, they were maybe part of the Catholic Church many years ago, but aren't anymore. And they're uncomfortable with churches. But, you know, a Bible study can be a little bit less intimidating. And the great part about it is that once they're, you know, either subscribed to a particular social media account or they're coming to, you know, a Bible study or whatever, it gives you that opportunity usually that you can send them messages. And the people who, they, again, because it's a situation where they're coming to you because they're looking for something, um, it's easier to stay in contact with them. I have found that they're usually looking for some kind of encouragement because if they're seeking a group or if they're, they're seeking out that kind of thing, um, you know, I have somebody who wants to come to Shorewood next week, and usually I get four or five people every week who show up who, you know, want to hear about things or they want to know more about the Bible or they want to understand more about, you know, salvation, and we just went over, you know, do you have to be baptized to get saved and stuff just recently. So um, if you're, my finding is that if you're looking to try and do something where you're really trying to draw people in and help get them into church, there are so many unchurched people who actually are looking like I thought I was going to have to do more convincing, but there's a lot of people who are really desperate for spiritual food and, and desperately starving for encouragement, especially. And so it, I'm kind of new to it, but I have found that, you know, putting things out there and, and trying to work with ways that people go about looking for that kind of thing and just putting it out there, that can draw in a lot of people as well. Thank you yeah. for sharing that. Yes, ma'am. Well, it's really It gives you professionalism. Right. Any other comments? Yes, sir. Uh, you might have to be a little careful with this one, but uh, on the south side of Chicago, the grace of God does work. <laughs> <laughs> on the south side of Chicago, believe it or not. But uh, Pastor Johnson and I, we were walking the streets. Uh, we were advertising for the uh, seminar we were having, and you'd be surprised the number of people that will actually give you their phone number and their email if you just ask. We want you to engage in that conversation, so that's the way you can get some contact information for the for the follow up. So uh, you have to be kind of careful, you know, with the man, women thing, that type of thing. But uh, when you engage in a little conversation, people they used to giving out their cell phone, they used to giving out their email. Mm -hmm. Then you follow up. Cool. Amen. Sir, now, a lot of people have touched on this, but uh, I think if people see us working close together uh, in a group and they see our sincerity and really wanting to help help the people that come up to the booth, that really means a lot. Because right. uh, people are sincere about their football teams and their, and their little dogs. It was ladies with uh, strollers and they had their dogs in the stroller. <laughs> and so if people are sincere about their lives and if they see us, sincere about 
the word of God rightly divided, it really, uh, it really is very prominent in their, that when they see that. And, and they see that we love each other and, and we're not uh, religious uh, scholars. I mean, I'm just a common person. I, I, I volunteered because I'm trying to get over my fears of talking to people and about the gospel and it really helped. And I, I can see the improvement in my life and when people see that, that you're sincere, it touches them. You know? And I think that's the most important part. I want to mention something. We did at the flea market one time. This is in the category of what not to do. <laughs> so we, we had uh, a banner uh, with Christ Died for Our Sins on it that was pretty large. We had it up. They didn't care. We paid a, a fee for the flea market booth, so they weren't really worried about our sales or anything like that. They just, you know, they're not expecting that. But uh, we were on a on a crossroad kind of thing where you're walking down the aisles and we were on the end where uh, where the cross took place and then there's another six or eight booths on, on each side and there are people in those booths trying to sell things and they were complaining a little bit about this is scaring our customers off, okay? <laughs> because this wasn't a little sign, it was a big giant banner. Mm -hmm. So we decided, well, this is too much. It's not... It's maybe not the kind of thing to put up, okay? Uh, we did have a bunch of tracks, uh, out, a, a big load of different kinds of tracks, and uh, the Baptist Church kids, that they had a, uh, a little booth around the corner, and they came over and they started getting some of our tracks and reading them, and then came back and wanted more tracks because they said they were a lot better than theirs. <laughs> <laughs> so that was a plus, but Amen. some things you gotta be careful about you guys are talking about the banners and what they re recommend or require or won't let you have, but you got to be careful too about the other people around you that are trying to sell goods and make money and all that. So that's one thing. Ricky, did you have something? Yeah, just I'm I'm we're talking about swap meets and everything. Something even simpler that we've done the last two years at church now is we have a parking lot sale free. Everything's free. We just take two weeks. People bring their junk from their house, empty out your garage, because when we're done, it's going right to Goodwill. We're not set it up. Free signs all over the neighborhood. Free sell this way. We actually had three people get saved. We had introduced. We had to fight with the neighbor, our crazy neighbor again, but that was good because it showed everybody else how to handle a neighbor that was out of line. We have three folks get saved. One guy came down from the church at the other end of our corner, which is name it, claim it, we'll heal you on Wednesday nights. He came down, he came to church two weeks in a row, and finally figured out it wasn't for him, but it was free. We just gave the stuff away. One lady, she's like, are you sure this is free? You know, you know it's free, <laughs> but here's some information that you need to have that is really free. And we gave a gospel, we handed out 100 tracks if you're counting tracks because it was 250 stacks and they were gone but we have a gentleman in our assembly that speaks Spanish and it was a good thing he was there because when in our community when people see free certain communities gravitate to that and out of those ladies four ladies got saved out of the same house so it was just something we tried and we have a young, a young lady that comes and winter visits with us and She's like, can we do this? And I'm like, yep, let's do it. And we had great results. Now the follow-up part has been harder because the language barrier with everybody. So, but just another idea, if you're in a neighborhood, have a free parking lot sale. Then yeah. get the stuff to Goodwill. Don't clog, don't clog up everything. Yeah. Take it away. Jesus junk. Jesus All right. Junk. Thanks for the great comments, guys. Any any other comments? I know you're trying to close up, that's why I don't have a lot to say, but I want to know one thing. 
Does someone have a patent on this thing, or are they just? Are there a lot of them? I heard him saying they've been doing it for 15 years, or but something. not not the boxes. Okay, now is there? Is you can there make a patent on that, or you something. You can come take pictures and make your own, or I could have someone make one for you. Okay. There is no patent. Okay, just, yeah, okay. whatever way you want to do it. Ted, did you have something? Um, yeah, the, the the side benefit is is it will oftentimes draw your own people out of their shell as they see you share the gospel <coughs> and the things you said about it being a positive experience for people because the people that stop are the people that are that choose to stop it really dawned on me because I was really surprised how positive you know I was expecting the confrontation I was expecting the argument and very little of that because because again, you've got people that are interested, but I've seen it be a positive thing for our folks mm -hmm. who watch this happen. It, it draws them out of their shell and gives them exposure to sharing the gospel apart from the fair, you know, just in their own life and their own, right. their own uh, circle of influence. Yeah, good, good point. Any final words? Rick, anything you want to add to this? I would say. Alex and I have a privilege of being pastors to most of these guys. And when Rodney asked about how many folks come to the church through it, uh, I look at Charlotte and I think, we've, we've been doing evangelism training since the 80s. She was in the first class we ever did. We, the first weekend, what they had to do was go down, we took them on a bus down to the city and said, here, here are 10 three by five cards. You can't come home until you got 10 names of people that gave you an appointment and a phone number to call them back and share the gospel. Mm -hmm. I told them what to ask. Here's how you approach somebody. Here's what you say. Send them that. Charlotte got the most. And they put a pretty girl, girl smile and she'd get numbers. We got nine. One guy that talked a lot but never did it, he didn't get any. Only, only one, about 15 people and only one guy didn't get Everybody had appointments to, to talk and share the gospel, which we then followed up. And what it does, what this does, these young guys doing all these things, Lauren here with meetup.com, whoever heard of that? Well, some of her age did. You put it on there, some have it, and then people come and say, what? You know, my generation, you put an ad in the classifier, that kind of stuff. What, do people, what it does in your assembly, the impact it has on, on your people for zeal mm -hmm. and for to stir them up internally. Every time they set these things up and they go, the people that come back, they come back, wow, just really fired up. Whether anybody's necessarily gotten saved or not, the impact it has on them. Mm -hmm. and these young guys and, and gals have used their own creative genius to take the doctrine out into the world they live in. As a pastor, I know Alex and I think a lot about how impactful that is and how that stirs up. Now, all this ministry comes from that kind of thing and from seeing an opportunity and then to, to advance it. A meeting like this, somebody says, well, you know, what about this? Now, you're brainstorming. They'll go home, they're already thinking about, you're going to talk about how to follow up and do that kind of thing. You know, we have a radio program. Let's advertise that. You have these conferences. So how to do follow-up. So to me... Getting started with it and the the stir that it that it causes among your own people, whether anybody ever comes into the church, particularly for it, that's more of a local issue. You know, we used to go to Taste of, uh, uh, of Chicago. Five million people, none of them live in, Sha in, in Rolling Meadows, and you know, have them live in Wisconsin. So we, we, we said, well, we need to narrow it down and kind of do that. But that, that's, even if you're doing those kind of things, the stir that it causes, and in your own soul, a couple of times a year, personally, I go downtown, down at the corner of Michigan Avenue, and, uh, and uh, the, the bridge there, the big area across the street, and, and, and stand there and pass out tracks. I used to preach, but my voice doesn't handle that much anymore. I've been doing that for 30 years. Couple times, I don't tell anybody I go. We'll go on the train, go down. And I do that for me. Because every now and then I think, you know, I just need to go and see what's happening in the country. And you do that. And these are opportunities most people aren't going to be 
and I've done that since I was a teenager, so it's not, not foreign to me. But most of our folks don't have that opportunity to do that. And these kind of things give them the opportunity, and that, but when I see them come back into the assembly, they don't come back just as, you know, Bible students, they come back as warriors. Mm -hmm. It's what they've learned they've gone out and used mm -hmm. and seen a reason. And when somebody has a reason for what they believe, and see that word work in people, uh, that that stirs your soul in a, in a way of growth that, that there's just in any other way. And I, I sit here and look at it and I think as a pastor, I think, praise the Lord. Those 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 little boxes with the surveys and stuff, these guys figured out how to do that. And I think, wow, you know, that, that's creative. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I think, I can tell you, I, what I'm doing is I'm committed to all of you and ministries in other places, that it's, it's worth the effort and the zeal, and it causes the, 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 the kind of spiritual growth among your people, vision-wise, energy-wise, tenacity-wise, that, that you're trying to stir, and it's doing it the right way. You're not just trying to kick them and push them into it. It comes out of inside. So this is something that I, you know, I'm, if I say I'm proud of, have an opportunity to have this, I, that would be, you could take that in a good way. But I, I, I respect what's going on and, and value it because it's, it's, it's good, it's an example for everybody to see, hey, there's a way for me to be involved in it too. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Yeah, Ted. Can I just say one other thing? It reminded me of the first year of the class. We, a bunch of us took a trip up into Wisconsin and Oscar Woodall came and we spent a weekend talking about the gospel. And one of the things Woody did was challenge us to write our own testimony and write our own gospel track. It is so much easier to give a track that you have written. Mm -hmm. This is my story. This isn't Dr. So-and-so. And that's a transformation experience, too, where you can write your own gospel track, make it clear, put your own name on it, tell your own story. Mm -hmm. And it's a tremendous tool to use in personal evangelism and personal work. Thank you. All right. Other comments? Then we'll, we'll close. But thank you all for being here, and thank you for the, the great comments. Father, we thank you for this time. We thank you that, uh, we thank you for the folks that you've saved. We thank you for the position you've given us in your son. We, pr we pray, Lord, that, that your word would just get a hold of our hearts, and that we would have a a desire to preach your word, that we would have a desire to take advantage of the, the doors of utterance. And we just pray, Lord, that you would use us for your glory.